I'm Mark Gollum. And November 2nd marks the 100th anniversary of one of the most momentous days in all of Jewish history. For on November 2nd, 1917, Great Britain's Foreign Minister Lord Arthur Balfour formally informed the world in a letter addressed to a leader of the Jewish community in Great Britain, Lord Walter Rothschild, that his country supported the Zionist quest to recreate, after nearly 2,000 years of Jewish dispersion, a Jewish homeland in Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, known at the time as Palestine. The essential paragraph in Lord Balfour's letter reads, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object in being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. And the letter concludes, I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. And I'm sure virtually all of you know that this letter became known evermore as the Balfour Declaration, a defining moment in the history of the modern state of Israel and of the Jewish people. It may be difficult for those born long after the Balfour Declaration to appreciate the enormity of the world-changing significance of the Balfour Declaration. But in many ways, it literally paved the way to the creation of the modern state of Israel. At the same time, like all legal documents, the Balfour Declaration is not without its ambiguities and interpretations. And within the Jewish community, there are many misunderstandings of what the Balfour Declaration actually said and accomplished. So for some insight into the significance and substance of the Balfour Declaration, I'm extremely pleased to have on our JBS phones a scholar who brings some very special expertise to the discussion of this historic document. He's a modern British historian, professor at Georgia Tech University, and he's the author of an award-winning book entitled The Balfour Declaration, The Origins of the Arab-Israel Conflict, for which he received the 2010 National Jewish Book Award Professor Jonathan Schneer. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. I'm happy to do it. Jonathan, from your perspective, just to begin with, how would you describe the significance of the Balfour Declaration? Um, I think that your introduction uh, was, was quite correct, although it's only uh, half the story. It is, for sure, a foundation stone of modern Israel. Um, but, of course, uh, and, and therefore, all um, Zionists are, uh, 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 will celebrate its 100th anniversary. But also, of course, uh, history is complicated, and the Balfour Declaration was simultaneously a foundation stone for, for the dispossession of um, the non-Jewish people um, in Palestine, and they see it, therefore, as something not to be celebrated, but as something to be deplored. I understand. And, you know, the Balfour Declaration says, nothing shall be done to prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Did the British understand that there was going to be, that there was in Palestine a Muslim Arab community which reacted badly, especially once it understood what was happening, it reacted badly first to the Declaration, but more so 
to this Zionist movement, which the Balfour Declaration validated. How much did the British understand, do you think, Jonathan? I don't. That's a very um, good, uh, a good question, and therefore a difficult question to answer. Here is my understanding. There were a number of British officials who understood very well that the Arabs who lived in Palestine, who outnumbered Jewish settlers um, by something like seven to one, um, would react very badly to this. And some of those Brit British officials were deeply conflicted as a result. On the other hand, other British officials, also understanding that the non-Jewish majority in Palestine would act, would react badly, uh, were prepared to face that down for a number of reasons that we can go into. In other words, I think what I'm saying in answer to your question is that, by and large, the British did realize that, that this document would lead to future difficulties, and yet, nevertheless, they were prepared to go through with it. And I'm happy to tell you why I think they were prepared to do that, if that's your next question. All right. Let's t you know what? Hold that question for one second. Okay. I want, first of all, our audience to understand. My own perspective is Great Britain expressed something that is a reality. The reality is the Jewish people have had a historic connection to this Eretz Yisrael, and that for whatever reason, and, and uh, Jonathan will get into that for a moment, Great Britain was prompted in part to support that move. It was much later, I shouldn't say much later, it was seven years later or so, in, um, in the early 20s when the League of Nations ultimately was dividing the Ottoman Empire into many states, most of which, all of which were Arab, that the League of Nations decided it was going to also create one Jewish state. And that was going to be the Jewish state in Palestine. And we're going to talk to the gentleman about that in a moment. So that for me, the Balfour Declaration, while it's, I don't know, I think you, you would agree, it's, it's enormously misunderstood in the Jewish community, it still was a very important, positive, wonderful document that deserves celebration on its 100th anniversary. Having said that, I want to take one moment of digression to ask you to comment on a letter that preceded the Balfour Declaration by two years, the letter by Sir Henry McMahon, who described how Great Britain in 1915 was prepared to recognize and support the independence of the Arabs in all the regions within the limits demanded by the Sharif of Mecca, which included Palestine. So in 1915, the Arabs feel Great Britain is promising the entire area, including Palestine, to them. Two years later, the British promise to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And as Jonathan has said, both sides, as a result, felt that they had received a promise from Great Britain. Jonathan, to what extent do you feel I've described it accurately? I think you've described it very accurately, with, with one small exception. You, you, you refer to a Jewish homeland. In fact, as you, as you read it, the, the Balfour Declaration does not say that word. It says home. A and the reason is that a homeland does, in fact, imply a state, whereas a home implies something else. I'm not exactly sure what. And, and, even, and the Zionists, the British Zionists, about whom I know something, uh, didn't speak about um, a Jewish state in Palestine during those years because they knew it would um, alienate too many uh, potential allies in the British government. So they were very careful only to talk about a Jewish home in Palestine in public. No doubt in private they always 
we're looking forward towards a Jewish state. Yes, Jonathan, part of what you're saying is exactly why I wanted to talk to you. There is a nuance to the Balfour Declaration and an ambiguity. <clears throat> this takes away in no way in my mind from the greatness of the document and its role in the establishment of the State of Israel. But I do want you now to address the question which you were about to answer for me. There are many different explanations for why Great Britain, through Lord Balfour, would issue this declaration. What motivated the British government in 1917 to issue the Balfour Declaration? Right. Um, well, I, can, I think I can answer that. Uh, there, historians point to a number of reasons, and I will list them, and then I'll tell you the one that I think is the most important. Good. Um, first of all, there were in the British government people who genuinely sympathized with Jewish aspirations um, and who felt also that the, the, the Jews had been oppressed for centuries and were great people, and they sympathized with them. That's number one. Number two, and overlapping to a degree, there were men in the government and the foreign office, including Balfour and Lloyd George, the prime minister, who can be described as Christian Zionists and who took satisfaction in thinking that the policies of the British government could lead to a Jewish return to Palestine, which in turn would be a precondition for the second coming. So that's the second. Third, um, if you look at the map, Palestine overlooks Egypt, and the Suez Canal is located, as everybody knows, in Egypt. And the Suez Canal in those days was Britain's economic... Uh, lifeline and jugular vein it, at one and the same time. It was the root to all the riches of the empire, and it was crucial that Britain therefore control the Suez Canal, control Palestine, and likewise also be confident that the surrounding countries um, would not could not pose a threat to Egypt, Palestine being one of them. And the British thought that they might establish a protectorate there after the war and that it would be conducive to stability in Palestine if uh, there was a grateful population uh, of Europeans, uh, namely the Jews. Mm -hmm. So that's um, another reason. Mm -hmm. Then, um, so that's three. Oh, yes, four. Um, Increasingly, the government, the British government, feared that if they did not make some kind of gesture towards the Jews, that Germany would, and then that Germany would reap the reward. And, and that points, I think, to the fifth and most important reason, which will take a little bit of unraveling, and if I go on too long, please um, um, cut me off. Okay. Um, um, so the fifth reason is that the British were convinced that Jewish influence could help them win World War I. That's why they didn't want the Germans to get it. The British governing elite, by and large, um, ascribed to a kind of genteel anti-Semitism, not to be confused with the murderous anti-Semitism practiced in Russia or Russian Poland or... Romania, um, but members of the governing elite in Great Britain tended to believe that Jews exercised some vast and subterranean influence over world affairs, and specifically they thought that American Jews could influence the American President Wilson to come into World War I on the side of the Allies. And they simultaneously believed that Russian Jews could influence the government in Russia, which now was the liberal regime of Kerensky, 
to stay in the war. Um, and so they desperately wanted uh, Jewish support. And they thought, and, and then the great uh, achievement of the British Zionist leader, Chaim Weizmann, was to persuade them that the most important Jews were all Zionists. Mm -hmm. And what did Zionists want? They wanted Palestine. Mm -hmm. So how could the British government win Jewish support? It would have to win over Zionists, and it could do that by offering them Palestine, hence the Balfour Declaration. Okay. And this was all done in order to win World War I, which I, I think is the most important motivation of the British government. I understand. Um, in releasing the Balfour Declaration. And it is probable that all of the reasons you gave, all five, in some way impacted the decision, yes? Yes, okay. absolutely. I'm but, sure they did. Okay. By the way, you know there is a, a, a narrative told that in some way Great Britain wanted to reward yeah. Chaim Weizmann for right. the creation of dynamite. Yes. Is there any truth to that? Well, it wasn't dynamite. It was um, it was acetone. Yes. He, Weizmann was a very, very brilliant chemist, in addition to being everything else he was. And he made an important contribution to the British war effort as a chemist, because I think, if I remember right, he invented a way to derive acetone, which is an important element in, the Brit in British in, in explosives, from grain rather than wood, because they were running out of wood. The, the story is that the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, said to Weizmann, what, what can I, how can I possibly reward you for this? And Weizmann said, I want nothing for myself, but I want Palestine for my people. Yes. Um, but I can say that in all the research I did, in the archives, I never saw any reference to this anywhere. And I think it's probably um, just merely a lovely story or anyway an elaboration upon a lovely story. I understand. Okay, let me ask you a couple of specific questions. Most important of all, there are Jews who think the Balfour Declaration is the international legal justification for the state of Israel. Is the Balfour Declaration the, founda founda the foundation document that validates the state of Israel? <laughs> you laugh. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, I'm not um, an expert on international law. I, I don't see how it... I, I mean, now uh, you are asking a historian not a legal expert. Um, it's it's All right. not a... Let me say it a different way. Yeah. yeah. My understanding is that while the Balfour Declaration indicated a sentiment, a mood, a Western uh, imprimatur on Jews returning in some way, you, you point out it says home, not homeland. Right. And you also say that with it, you know, behind closed doors, everybody understood in England they were talking about creating a Jewish, a Jewish polity for the Jews to return. The, the and, Jews understood this. The Zionists understood this. Yes, and yeah. also you're saying there were some in the British elite who wanted the Jews out. They should go back to Palestine. Well, I didn't. Yes, I, I should have said that. Yes. yes, you're absolutely right. Okay. They're, they're, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Yes, you're right. Okay, but it's really. San Remo and the League of Nations, which in the early 20s creates the international legal justification for the state of Israel when there was international sanction of a whole series of countries inside what was the Ottoman Empire and that the legal justification for the state of Israel is not the Balfour Declaration as important a mood setter as it was but it is not a legal binding document of an international nature. Are you comfortable yes. with that analysis? Yes, I, I am comfortable with that analysis. Okay, one more question. What prompted the phrase in the Balfour Declaration 
that the Declaration shall not prejudice the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in other countries. Most people understand why it should not prejudice any rights of non-Jews living in Palestine. But what a curious thing to add to the Balfour Declaration, that the Declaration should not make it more difficult for Jews at the time living in other countries. What's the genesis of that phrase? I can explain that. Um, in Great Britain in 1940, in 1914, there were something over 40 million people. There were 300,000 Jews. Of the 300,000 Jews, something like 8,000 belonged to Zionist organizations, of which there were two or three. Um, for many, many decades, the Jewish community in Great Britain had been represented not by Zionists, but by men who believed that Judaism does not, that Jews do not represent a separate um, people, uh, let alone race, although race was often the word used in those days, but merely shared a belief system that could be practiced anywhere. And therefore, they did not accept that Jews should all move to Palestine, or that uh, Palestine was the natural home of the Jewish people. Far from it. They believed in assimilation, so that Jews in Britain should assimilate just as Catholics did or um, non-Anglican Protestants and the Jews in New York and the Jews in Boston and so on should assimilate. They should assimilate to the countries of their current residents and practice uh, Judaism, uh, but they didn't need a country, a specific country for it. All right. Now, in 1917, there was only one Jewish member of Lloyd George's government, and his name was Edwin Montague. And Montague was one of these assimilationists, and he was absolutely, profoundly opposed to the Balfour Declaration. And he argued against it in a number of papers that he presented to the British government. And he basically said, in the, he argued in those papers that if the government issued a Balfour Declaration, it would give, it would provide an excuse to anti-Semites everywhere to say to Jews in their countries, "Get out of here and go to your home. Go to, go back to Pal go to Palestine. That's where you belong." And he said, "Palestine will become the world's ghetto." And it was to try to somehow mollify Edwin Montague that um, they inserted those words in the Declaration. Okay. How in the world would a phrase like that prevent what Montague was frightened of? <laughs> um... Well, I don't suppose it possibly can. It I think that's, it, fair, it's, it's, it, that's a fair criticism. Okay. So either it was silly or it, at the same time, as you say, it mollified Montague and enabled the one Jewish member of parliament. Not of parliament. Of, of, uh, of his party. Right. Yeah. To, to support the Balfour Declaration. How no, I no, not sorry, but but not quite, because Montague was never reconciled to it. I see. Um, and they had just appointed him viceroy of India, and he kept saying, um, "How can I represent the British government in India when you've just said that my natural my n home is in Palestine?" Um, so he was never reconciled to it. He thought the British government had made a terrible mistake. Okay. Look, you write the book, The Balfour Declaration, The Origins of the Arab-Israeli Conflict. And we understand that, as you said at the top of the program, from the Palestinian perspective, it's the Nakba, the beginning of the Nakba. The Nakba actually right. refers to the War of Independence. Right. But the whole movement to bring Jews back to 
Eretz Yisrael from a Palestinian perspective is their Nakba, their, their, their disaster. So I understand why anybody would, could write a book that says the Balfour Declaration was in some way linked to the origins of the Arab-Israeli conflict, although the Arab-Israeli conflict, you and I understand, goes far beyond whether the Jews ever created a state of Israel or not. But understanding that, I'm asking you, as the author of that book, how would you describe, as we conclude, it's been wonderful talking to you, Jonathan. I want to ultimately meet you in person. But as, as, you, as we sort of wrap up, how would you summarize, not the problems inherent in the Balfour Declaration, which you've already touched upon, but how would you describe the features of the Declaration which deserve Jewish celebration on its 100th anniversary? Well, okay, the Balfour Declaration is the essential first step towards the creation of a Jewish state. The Zionists in Britain um, were very clear. They didn't want the French um, controlling Palestine after World War I. They didn't want an international condominium of powers, which was also suggested, controlling Palestine after World War I. They wanted, above all else, the British imprimatur, and that's what the Pal and that's what the Balfour Declaration gave them. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Again, it's been wonderful speaking to you. You and I will meet one day. If you're ever in the New York area, I want you in studio. And if I ever want to talk about other aspects of the British history as it applies to Jews, I'm calling you. I wish you called Tuva Hatzlachah continued success at Georgia Tech. And again, we'll speak again one day very soon. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jonathan Shear, professor of modern British history at Georgia Tech University, the author of the award-winning book entitled The Balfour Declaration, The Origins of the Arab-Israeli Conflict. It was wonderful to speak to him on the wonderful 100th anniversary of what is, without question, one of the most important, significant, life-changing documents in modern Jewish history, the Balfour Declaration. And again, the Balfour Declaration was the first formal document which propelled and made possible the fulfillment of a Zionist Jewish quest of some 2,000 years to return to the land of Eretz Yisrael and to create not a Jewish home, a Jewish homeland, a sovereign state of Israel. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, editors, John McDevitt and Cordelia Sporin, and the producer of this special on the Balfour Declaration here on JBS, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Am Yisrael Chai. Be well, my friends.